do. He doesn't. No, we're not One word. One word to describe the week, please, sir. Uh, building and construction. Hey. Um, I feel <laughs> I've, I wrote a column about building and construction on the weekend. I ran into national heartthrob Chris Pink this morning, along with Andrew <laughs> Kingston. I am not making Only that up. Only your heartthrob. And oh, he's everybody's heartthrob. Mm. Don't deny it. He's everybody's heartthrob. We all love a bit of the pink. If I was ever going to change teams, it'd be for Chris Pink. Yeah. And now I am here in the studio <laughs> with the opposition spokesman yeah. for building and construction. I feel it's a building and construction moment. Our oh. next panelist is the last great left wing hope inside the Labour Party. She's the <laughs> MP for the mighty man of the way. Manurewa is literally kryptonite to the right and if there is a god she will one day be the prime minister of the perpetual revolution that is Arena Williams Kilda Conway welcome to the show Kilda thanks for having me whose heartthrob am I we the people's the people's the people's the, people's, <laughs> the, the working people's heartthrob and no not just the working people's but the working group's heartthrob um what is <laughs> one word to describe the week please ma'am backwards let's hear it this government is taking new zealand backwards it's revenge politics there's nothing here for young new zealanders amen sister preach and last but certainly not least he's new zealand's answer to noam chomsky he hurts my neck because whenever i listen to him i'm nodding my head so much the only lefty who has never been wrong never been wrong 30% public intellectual, 30% activist, and 40% Hufflepuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Max Harris, welcome to the show. Oh, Such a pleasure to have you here. Best intro ever, thank you. One word to describe the week, please. Uh, heavy, I think. Yeah, um, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people affected by the Faikaha cuts, and it's pretty serious. Uh, yeah, sorry to, to bring the tone down from heartthrobs. So the what, the what uh, cuts? What the Faikaha, Ministry of Disabled People's uh, oh, Okay, sorry. Cuts to respite care and and it's, dis- and it's disgusting. It's absolutely it's disgusting the horrible. way we're treating the most vulnerable amongst us. Let's get into this evening's show. Issue one: Helen Clark is warning over New Zealand's independent foreign policy in the shadow of America, Russia, China, Iran, and Israel. Issue two: Latest News Hub details and the impact on the Fourth Estate journalism. And issue three tonight: Mega tunnel under Wellington. Why? Plus, we'll have a final word at the end of the show where each panellist can sound off and we'll see who can breach broadcasting standards this week. It'll be Arena Williams <laughs> talking smack about Damien Grant. I know it. I know it already. <laughs> Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. Over the weekend, Dame Helen Clark argued that New Zealand was risking its independent foreign policy by sucking up to America and attempting to join Pillar 2 of AUKUS. She made these comments as the ongoing trauma of the Middle East and Russian war in the Ukraine keeps erupting. As the Cold War heats up between America and China in the Pacific, can New Zealand hold on to its independent foreign policy, Damien? So Winston does his bark bark against Israel at the UN, and then 24 hours later, he is meeting the American military industrial complex. That sound you hear is David Longy's corpse rolling in his grave. Winston has sold out our independent foreign policy for three magic beans from the American. American military industrial complex. Thoughts? In a conflict between good and evil, if you want to sit in the middle, you are a coward and a quizzling. You can criticize the United States. I have. There are a lot of things wrong with it. But the, the Chinese Communist Party and the government there is a vile, evil, nasty regime. I don't know what they are doing to the Uyghurs. It may or may not be genocide, but it is unconscionable. What does John Key think of them? John Key is a disgraceful human being who continues to profit off his relationship with China, and he is a national disgrace. Um, I do not understand why my good friend Don Brash ha- has penned a letter with a, is it? It's not Dame Helen Clark. Helen Clark. She's not Dame Helen Clark, is she? she? Is, yes, she is. She is. She, is. she got a, Okay. All right. I thought she got turned it down. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So Dame Helen Clark. Good on her. Uh, I don't know why. Well, why isn't Don Brash got his knighthood? That's a real issue. Because we don't like Don Brash. He's a racist um, asshole. The, uh, he is not a racist asshole. He is. A, he is a good man. <sighs> However, what I do not understand. Um, I read. I read the column talking about it. It's the Thucydides trap. Am I saying that right, Max? Ah, Thucydides. I think. Thucydides. Thank you. Also, it's good to have a Greek scholar in the audience in the room. Uh, yeah, but, fa- but fundamentally, I. Well, you're a Rhodes scholar. Yeah, not a Greek scholar. Okay, all right. Close Rhodes, enough. yeah. Don't, do not, do not, do not, do not disagree with me, sir, especially when I am wrong. It is hurtful and I do not like it. I do not believe we should have an independent foreign policy. 
Um, or if we do have a no, sorry, let me rephrase that. Yes, we should we, we should have an independent foreign policy, and we look out there objectively, and we see there are good people and there are evil people, and we should sign with the good people. And for all its faults, the United States is a democratic country, and we should sign with that against a potentially genocidal totalitarian state. Follow up question: If you cue, as Helen Clark was making her criticisms, Iran launched a clearly telegraphed drone and missile strike as retaliation for Israel bombing an Iranian uh, Iranian diplomatic building. Netanyahu needs constant conflict and war so as to postpone any election and accountability. Will Netanyahu back down or launch a strike against Iran? What do we do if that happens? It is absolutely and utterly bull bollocks and untrue to claim that the government of Israel is constantly seeking and provoking war to postpone to prolong the administration of Netanyahu. The government of Israel currently is a coalition government that includes the leader of the opposition. I entirely reject the premise of your nonsense statement. The state of Israel, given the opportunity, just wants to get on with life, but it can't because Iranian proxies keep logging, lobbing bombs across the border, the lights of Hezbollah and so forth. I stand with Israel. So Netanyahu's entire political history of starting <clears throat> fights with the Palestinians, <clears throat> provoking it and all going all in, like his entire career, none of that matters and you think that he's just trying to get through. Netanyahu has never started a fight with the Palestinians. I every, can name every, them. Every fight that has ever happened has been one that the Israelis have been provoked and have responded. So your your problem is that the uh, the Israelis respond. Oh, no. Irina, when Russia commits war crimes, the West criticizes and sanctions it. When Russia uses hunger as a weapon, the West criticizes and sanctions it. And when Russia targets media, infrastructure and hospitals, the West criticize and sanction it. Yet when Israel does all of that on a vastly larger scale, tempered language from the West and no sanctions. Isn't Helen Clark already right? Haven't we already traded our independent foreign policy to America? Well, we need to strongly condemn those strikes by Israel and Iran. Um, targeting a diplomatic post is a no-go zone. And New Zealand has a proud history over the last two decades of developing what has been widely respected in the world as an independent forest mo- right. foreign policy. Right. We are the opposite of the kind of rhetoric that Damien has brought to this discussion. We have been able to be the adult in the room, and that's what I want, want from Aotearoa New Zealand now. Do we need to be a part of the ongoing conversations which are escalating these conflicts, or do we need to be able to step back and actually say, we're, we're well respected as a conduit in the Pacific, as a voice for a Pacific zone of peace. Yeah, We should continue that work and we shouldn't be signing up to something which New Zealanders by far and away have not had a public conversation about yet. And there is not a democratic mandate for this government to be joining up to not only AUKUS Pillar 2, but you know this wider for, uh, project of cozying up to one superpower at a time of rising tensions in the world. Follow-up question. Helen is arguing for New Zealand to use its independence, mm-hmm. to call for peace, and that we should be friend to all, enemy to none. Is that aspirational or is it naive? No, I think it's something that New Zealand is already respected for on the world stage, and we need to continue that. Our role in the Pacific actually really depends on how the government acts in the right? next six months. Yeah. We need to re-establish our place as an independent uh, leader in, in the Pacific. And that's really important to not only our trade relationships, but our diplomatic relationships around the world. This is not going to be easy, but there are blocks who have been able to, to negotiate between the two superpowers like ASEAN, which we can model ourselves on. Right. We can also you know, look to the role of countries like Norway, uh, who have over a number of decades developed for themselves a useful and progressive role in peace talks in the Middle East. We should be doing that work in, in not only Labour and opposition, but the government now. Max, the NZDF kindly informed us last week that their mission in Yemen will be, and I quote, kinetic and might kill civilians. Why are New Zealand taxpayers paying to bomb the poorest country in the Middle East in a tactic that almost every single intelligence network tells us will only empower the Houthi? Yeah, I think a lot of 
people listening would be surprised to learn that New Zealand's actively involved in this conflict in Yemen. And right. it speaks to this kind of gaping hole of public debate around foreign policy, as Ardena pointed out. Um, I think foreign policy is, is traditionally and for a long time been an area where a lot of work is done um, too much, in my view, in the shadows, and we need to bring that out of the shadows and have a proper public debate about it. And that yep. definitely extends to, to AUKUS. Um, by the way, for people that don't know, AUKUS is um, you know this alliance between Australia, the UK, and the US. It's about nuclear submarines. That's pillar one. And supposedly nuclear uh, uh, pillar two is about a non-nuclear technology arm. Um, in reality, those two pillars are connected. I think we do need to have a proper conversation about what this means for our nuclear-free positioning. And I think we can have a sophisticated conversation that goes beyond the sort of goodies and baddies analysis that Damien suggested earlier. Follow up question. There's a clip from last night highlighting the double standards at play here, and I just want to run it through. David Cameron, this is him speaking. Iran attacking Israel was reckless. The journalist. What would Britain do if our consulate was flattened? David Cameron. Oh, we would take very strong action. The West are already hypocrites on this, aren't they? Yeah, and I think an uh, increasing number of observers who are getting more engaged with foreign policy are um, raising questions about the double standards of human rights and international law. And um, yeah, that might be seen as concerning to some. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, yeah, there are real concerns about yeah, what's, what's happening, what um, you know, the ICJ has called uh, plausible genocide in Gaza. And I think just to bring it back to New Zealand, I think we could be asking harder questions as well about um, the complicity of, of New Zealand in what's going on um, in Israel. So we should be asking the government um, to give guarantees that no New Zealand intelligence is contributing to what is happening in Gaza. Well, that's right. That's uh, right. And, and I, we don't know that, do we? I'm not sure. I've, I've heard, you know, cast iron undertakings from the government to that effect. Uh, and yeah, I, I think, you know, as being part of the Five Eyes, um, we are connected to the US and, and to the UK, um, and, and I think we should be having debates about, so why about those did, connections. So why did Israel bomb the Arab consulate or whatever it was in Syria? Why did they do that? What prompted them? And why did they do it? I mean, this, this, this is what has provoked the Iranian response, but why did Israel do that? Was it just because they were feeling mean? I'm not going to speak for, for Israel, Damien. Well, we know the answer because Hezbollah, which is an Iranian proxy, has been firing missile after missile after missile and provocation after provocation in northern Israel. And you can't claim that that is a consequence of Israeli occupation of Lebanon because there is no Israeli occupation of Lebanon. This is just an endless series of Iranian provocations against Israel. Now, you can question whether the Israel response was, was correct or not, but Israel had a relatively limited attack against, okay, consulates shouldn't have done that, but they were against military targets. The Iranians went out there to kill as many civilians as they could by firing 300 <clears throat> and ballistic missiles and drones. This was an attempt to kill as many civilians as they possibly could. Now, they failed, but nobody... Because, nobody, nobody if, because I could just, if I could just come in, <clears throat> I, think, I think calling the, the bombing of a consulate a limited attack is, is absolutely reflects a loss of perspective. Like that, that, that is like an absolute no-no in Helen Clark's words in international law. That crosses so what about, a, what an about absolute red line. What about bombing civilians in northern Israel? I mean, no, if, no, 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 come on. That's a, if, bombing, if bombing a consulate is yep, a no-go, yep. what about firing missiles yes. into civilian areas of northern Israel. Is that a no-go area or are they just... Like, I, don't, I don't think you presented the, the full context, Damien, of recent months, which have included Israel's bombing of Lebanon. And of course, the broader context, which is over 30,000 civilians killed in uh, Gaza by Israel. You haven't you, said what, anything about that No, I'm, I'm, part I'm, of the broader I'm happy, context. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Where do you get the 30,000 figures from? Uh, over 33,000. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, figures you, uh, that are now widely cited by international media, recognising that the, the figures that have been coming out of Palestine are accurate. That's where I'm citing so, those figures from. So, OK, well, let's just assume that that's the, the 33,000. The, according to the IDF, something like ten to 12,000 um, Hamas soldiers have been killed. So if that's correct, you've got about 20,000 civilians, assuming that we trust the Hamas Ministry of, of Health, and of course, you know, Hamas is an utterly vile organisation, but let's just take the numbers at face value. So you've got, according to that, Israel is killing two civilians for every military um, uh, Hamas soldier that has been killed. That is not, <clears throat> that is not genocide, sir. That is, 
that is in a different planet to what genocide is. You cannot turn around and claim that Israel is committing genocide. We know what genocide looks like, and whatever has happened, you could claim it's a war crime if you like. I would ethnic disagree. cleansing war crime. You could claim, cleansing you, war could claim, you could you could make the argument that was ethnic cleansing. You can make the argument that it's a war crime. Not I would, genocide. I would He's disagree with you dictionary. on both. That's wonderful. But you cannot. But there is. But the allegation that the state of Israel is committing genocide, there is absolutely no historical basis for that when you look at actual genocides and it is a blood libel to turn around and claim ah. that what is happening in Israel is genocide how would you define just, just, how would you define genocide just briefly sir? Bomber, I mean it, genocide is an, an international legal concept there's a yep. very firm concept in the law it was applied by the International Court of Justice you don't define genocide by reference to how many civilians are killed compared to enemy combatants there's how a very clear definition which includes uh, intention which yes. was the issue uh, at stake in the land. ICJ and the ICJ said the yep. there was a, there was a plausible case. I don't want to derail the discussion, so, uh, but so I was, think so Damien, was, is was the attack was the attack on October the seventh? And if you're looking about intention, Hamas has made it really clear that they do, they do not want to see a single Jew living in the Levant. If you look at October the seventh, if you are relying on intention and not body count, was that not genocide? You're you're, you're jumping and darting around. It's a question. It's no, a question. no, no, no. Yes you're, you're no. talking at, at one point about genocide in Gaza and now trying to jump to to whether October the seventh was genocidal like, what was it we should be focusing on what is happening in Gaza as part of the broader no. context I'm not I'm not here to justify what happened on the 7th of October but I don't think we get good but analysis if we Damien, jump from not, Lebanon you're not, you're to not, Gaza you are to not here October to just, the 7th you are not here to justify the activities of October the 7th will you condemn them no let's talk about what New Zealand's role in all of this is which you know, I think a lot of your listeners will be wondering now. And this underscores the need for New Zealand to have an independent foreign policy, th- mm-hmm. which we have fought hard for on an international stage mm-hmm. for the last two decades. This government risks undermining that now by moving closer to one superpower without a public debate about that. Right. We need to be able to step back. We need to be able to de-escalate. New Zealand is well respected for that on the global stage. And both of you have pointed to how bloody and brutal these wars are, our role should be to avoid right. that. Damien, China is our economic overlord while America is our political master. Matthew Hooten wrote last week that conflict in the Pacific against China is inevitable, is it? I don't know the answer to that. If the, if the argument about the, the thuk, how do you say it again? <laughs> I'm no expert on this. <laughs> no, the, the thukunities trap, I can't say it. Um, if 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 Helen Clark and Don Brash are correct, that and what they were re- saying when they were referring to that is that there is a historical trend that when a rising power challenges a dominant power, yes. war appears to be inevitable. Yes. And they went back and they looked at sixteen cases of which twelve led to to conflict. Uh, certainly, um, there are a lot of issues. Taiwan is probably the red line that may well create it. I don't know if it will lead to a hot war. One hopes that the presence of nuclear weapons will cause cooler heads to prevail. Irena, uh, are we doomed to get sucked into a vortex of violence we can't get out of if we keep sucking up to America? Well, we have this choice now. And the difference between prior to the election, when Labour was uh, asking MFAT to work on how things like AUKUS would be beneficial to New Zealand. Yep. And then the rhetoric coming out of the official advice, but also from the government on uh, moving closer to America has has changed dramatically. It's about how we might participate in that now. And yeah, we do um, risk moving away from being able to be seen as independent on the world stage, being sucked into conflicts which are not our own, and leaving very, very few nations able to defend this consensus, this period of peace that we are in now. Max, we can't stop dolphins disrupting our boat races. Why have a military at all? Shouldn't we consider neutrality? Yeah, I think there's an interesting conversation about neutrality um, that I think we shouldn't get mixed up with independence. Um, so, yeah, there's some talk about Switzerland in the South Pacific. Like, I, I think the long-standing tradition of independence and in foreign policy, which which Damien also uh, supports, um, yeah, is about being relatively non-aligned. That doesn't necessarily mean being neutral. That means being careful about our alliances, mm-hmm. being values-based. And I think the the gravitational pull of independent foreign policies, like demonstrated by the fact that, that you know, even even Damien couldn't say, you know, we shouldn't have an independent foreign policy. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we should throw that aside, like with with really great care. Um, and I, I think I worry that there's a, a, a sort of backsliding that's happening at the moment without a conversation with the public. 
Uh, quick round to you all. Which global hotspot will impact this, us the most? The Middle East, Ukraine, or Taiwan? Damien. Um, I don't. I, I don't know. My my crystal ball has uh, failed. It will probably be something completely unexpected because one of the things that we have seen, other than yourself, who who saw the war in Ukraine three years ago. So the assumption is that we can see whatever it is that is going to be the trigger point. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that, that we can. I'm sorry. Which will be the, 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 the hot spot for New Zealand, Ukraine, Russia, or Ukraine, Middle East, or Taiwan? I agree with what Damien said, but I think New Zealand should be very cautiously watching what's going on in Taiwan. Um, you know, we can't be dewy-eyed about our relationships with Asia and with yep. China. Yep. Um, and we need to pay very close attention to what happens in Taiwan, especially with Taiwan's democracy. That yep. is something that New Zealand should support. Um, but And we should also maintain our independent foreign policy in the way that we have over the last two decades, where we have called out China on the abuses that we see. Um, that is one where, where I think New Zealand should be closely involved. Max? I actually think we should be thinking about the Pacific a lot more. And um, I think there are connections between some of those other potential conflicts and the Pacific. And to come back to the where we started on this, I think a lot of leading voices in the Pacific are calling on New Zealand not to join AUKUS, and um, we should be listening to them. Right. Mm. Uh, we have to move on, comrades, to issue two. For the state journalism, looks like it will manage to limp along for another couple of months as a deal between Warner Brothers News Hub and Stuff looks like they've saved a few jobs. Stuff have very little experience in broadcast media, yet managed to convince Warner Brothers their pitch was better than everyone else. Has the death of mainstream media been avoided or just postponed? Uh, Arena uh, Broadcasting Minister Melissa Lee has been utterly missing in mm. action here. The fact remains that the media market is broken and she still hasn't signed up to the Fair Digital News Media Bargaining Bill. Does this deal herald a new dawn or a shorter night? Well, the right question is where Melissa Lee has been in this. Ministers don't just have a role in funding or legislating for these things. They should be involved in facilitating the discussions that we've seen play out today. Yeah. I'm worried about those 300 staff who uh, are still uncertain about where their jobs um, are going. And those are talented people. We could yeah. lose them to New Zealand where they should be here in those high value jobs that we yeah. always talk about in politics as being really important for New Zealand's growth. It's the minister's role to make sure that there is a place for those people, that they have certain in their work and that they are being protected in the way that we, we want to see because I think all New Zealanders want to see a thriving media market and these people, local people, telling our stories and getting attention on the world stage. The the fair digital bargaining bill, it's ready to go. Melissa right? was asked 40 days ago by the Prime Minister yeah. to take action on this. She should have gone there, number one. Uh, follow up question Wouldn't merging TVNZ and Radio New Zealand have protected public broadcasting from the crisis that is currently rocking the industry? Yeah, I think, you know, we have to think about how those mergers, but also how, you know, more broadly the role of public journalism um, is protected in New Zealand. And whether it's that solution, whether it's, you know, a solution for. Uh, firming up the role of a public interest broad broadcaster in legislation so that people can have faith in the place of public yep. broadcasting yep. and that it is genuinely somewhere where they can go for the best information that is factual and true. Um, yeah, I, I think we don't have to have all the solutions ready to go now, but something like the digital bargaining bill that would have seen big corporate interests right? paying for New Zealand stories would have got us some time to yeah. figure those things out. Uh, Max Winston spews conspiracy theories that the entire media, the entire media was bribed, and then we wonder why trust in mainstream media has slumped. Isn't part of the problem here that so many Kiwis have now swallowed, have, have now been swallowed up by social media hate algorithms that they believe demented dimensions of reality? Is, isn't that part of the, the like, the problem's us. Is it, it's, I mean, sure, oh, the media hasn't done this, but us as, an, as a population have gone a bit crazy, haven't we? I mean, I think that's probably a, a small minority. I think um, we should be looking at ourselves and thinking about how um, the way we absorb media has changed. Henry Cook wrote a good piece about this, actually, including about how you know we don't con consume media as a like, bundle. We we look at we take individual stories and how the media has to adapt. I think one other important point that comes out of uh, what's happened with News Hub and then thinking back to what happened with Today FM is that 
private equity funded corporate media is is quite volatile yeah. and quite um, unstable. Yeah. And uh, perhaps for, for media infrastructure, which is central to a democracy, uh, we should be thinking about uh, more stable ways to mm. yeah, ensure media continuity, including public broadcasting. Follow up question. The only winners of less new scrutiny are the powerful and politicians not wanting accountability. Why should Kiwis care about public broadcasting? Uh, New Zealanders should care about public broadcasting um, because uh, I do think there's such a thing as journalism in the public interest that is not uh, being paid for by corporates at a time when I think we, we should be really vigilant about uh, the, the role of PR and the, and the role of the private sector in driving stories. Um, New Zealanders should uh, care about public interest journalism because long-term journalism shifts politics and policy. Um, it's, it's probably contributed to various positions New Zealand's taken um, in relation to independent foreign policy, to come back to the, the first thing we talked about. Um, so I think we do need to stand up for that. We do need to defend things like the Public Interest Journalism Fund against some of the more conspiratorial takes. Um, and we should be talking about yeah, what new institutions can um, make sure that public broadcasting has a future. You Damien, can't, my you can't defend the um, it's a cause and effect issue there. So you're saying that public interest journalism or uh, public interest journalism is good because yeah. it's led to an outcome that you support, like independent foreign policy. I don't think you that's said you a, supported it earlier as well. Yeah, but that's but that's not that's that's irrelevant. There are lots of things I support or don't support. I, I don't think you can make the argument that because this one thing has happened that I like, therefore we should support public interest journalism. I think yeah, I not, don't I don't. I don't, I don't support public interest journalism. You all. don't support anything in the public. <coughs> Damien, Mike no. Hosking on ZB made a very pertinent Great point man. this Legend. week. His number one rated breakfast show has four producers. As opposed to about 20. Radio yeah, New yeah, Zealand yeah. Morning Report has 16 producers. Thoughts? Uh, every one of those 16 is absolutely vital and critical and not a single one, not a hair on a head of those single 16 can afford to be touched. And we need we need to tax the working class harder to make sure that not a single producer at, at Radio New Zealand loses even a minute of their employment. Follow-up question. Media commentator Gavin Ellis writes today saying politicians for the past two decades have failed to correct the distortionary effects of transnational digital platforms mm -hmm. that extract huge amounts of money from this country on the endeavours of others while creating or exacerbating a string of social ills. A multitude of laws have been allowed to become outdated thoughts. That's just that's just a rant. There's no. That's right. There's but, no. <laughs> the, <laughs> he's speaking the public, truth to power. Is what the he's public, doing. The public. The the idea that the government should turn in to, should turn up and say to Google, "Hey, you know, you guys there, we've got this other industry over here that's making chocolate bars or something. They're not doing very well." You need to you need to give them some money. It's an absolute nonsense. No if the one private can fight the overlords. Uh, so Damien, then, they're, they're then not entirely they, different sectors. They, We're talking about Google drawing news stories from New Zealand journalism and paying a contribution to reflect that. And and if if they don't want to do that, then the the journalists themselves or the the the, the owners like NZME need to find a way by which they can protect their content and make it work. And if they can't, they go out of business. That is the Schumpterian creative destruction at work. You, uh, the, the idea that we sit there and we have a look, a rosy tint of view of what the media was like in 2010 and say so we have to preserve that in amber. And, and in order to preserve it in amber, we're going to go to Google and Facebook, who remember, Google and Facebook are the mighty overlords of today in the same way that <clears throat> Netscape was in, in, in its time. So... You know, who, the, the, it's, it's, it's a nonsense. You know, you're talking about AI algorithms potentially going, grabbing stuff and then churning it around and spitting it out. We're going to try and regulate and get money out of chat GBT. No. If the people who are producing this journalism can't find a way to, to pay for it, then they have to find another source of income. Maybe they can start a podcast. Uh, quick round to you all. The very first no editorial, the very first editorial in the New Zealand Herald, was calling on white New Zealanders to go to war with Maori. When you consider on, what, that what, the very what? first editorial in the oh, New right, Zealand okay. Herald is back, was back calling on Europeans to go to war with Maori. You when you consider, that? when you consider how Maori were used as a punching bag in the last election, has anything really changed in New Zealand media since that very first New Zealand Herald editorial, Damien Grant? 
I, I have not read that no. editorial, so I have of course no you haven't. idea. But when what 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 the very first that was the that was the fine. very first that the very first New Zealand Herald editorial called on white people no, to go to this war is with Maori. This is it. This is it. This is it. Because because this is what Max is saying. So at a point in time, there was the media, and the media at the time was saying, "Hey, let's have a race war." And this is the media that we must preserve it at all costs, and we have to we have to tax the schooners who are doing fur seals or whatever to make sure that the media that existed in 1860 or whatever it was is perfectly preserved. This is what you want to do with 2010 media. You want to preserve the media as it currently is because you like the way it is. Just let the media evolve or die. Irena, surely it's always it's, it's always been this way, hasn't missing, it? Missing the point here. The market's failing to provide these stories, which are New Zealand stories, and it won't happen if we don't take action as, yep. as New Zealanders to make sure that we have this content because Google and Facebook are not interested in being able to tell those local stories and the things which are important to us. My dad was really involved in setting up Aotearoa Radio and then Māori TV. Yes. That is something that is so special to the way that New Zealand get their information now it's telling stories that were never available to people before people like it yeah, yeah it's popular that this is available to people that people can access this stuff and it wouldn't be if we didn't take active action at the government level to make sure that it was available for not only New Zealanders now but for the future this is another thing that you know if the government fails to act here they are taking us backwards backwards of a whole generation of people who have fought for and won mm. the right to tell their stories it did our Maori and in English about mm. our own history Max New Zealand media has always been pretty racist hasn't it I think yeah. The point that raises is that um, yeah, if we if if we have media that's too responsive to metrics or to what it perceives the public uh, wants, uh, yeah, then we can get real gutter journalism. And I think Kirsty Johnson and Henry Cook have both made this point recently about uh, metrics and being too guided by that. We don't have um, a market in media that operates as a perfect market, <laughs> like Damien would suggest. We have uh, a media landscape that can be very unstable because it's. Um, uh, steered by sometimes the, the whims of these uh, funders who make uh, sometimes yeah, quite quick decisions about pulling pulling funding, not entirely based on success in the market. But to come back to the point about racism, um, I think uh, we we should reflect critically on uh, how the media, including in criminal justice stories, might uh, amplify racism towards Māori in particular. And we should, as Arana was saying, come back to what uh, journalism that looks to the long term can do, which is also get behind uh, the agendas of those in power um, and get at something uh, called truth that we that we might still believe in um, and uncover uh, through those agendas what is actually going on uh, and, sh- and to share that with all of us. Comrades, we must move on to issue three. After scrapping the Cook Strait Ferry replacements, cancelling Auckland Light Rail and slashing public transport subsidies, National are now suggesting a 10 10- Billion dollar long tunnel under Wellington Max. National seem to have realised the two tunnel plan won't solve any of the problems they're supposed to fix. So we now have the long tunnel plan instead. When will our capital get a basic functioning infrastructure? Yeah, that's right. I had someone suggest to me today that um, the reason Simeon Brown's al- alighted on this is because he's had to make this trip every day, you know, from the airport. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, this, this long guys. tunnel is, uh, is, you know, in his interests. But, yeah, I mean, I think um, what this really shows to me is uh, how self-serving some of the government's uh, rhetoric is. So, you know, earlier in the week they talk about the need to tighten our belts and to, to – cut spending, yeah. uh, but when it comes to yeah a, a proposal that's in line with their ideological agenda, they're very happy to to, to float this idea of, of, a, of a $10 billion tunnel. They, they, they talk the language of, of devolution uh, while at the same time doing a, a fast track approvals bill that, that centralises power massively, and then they propose something that, that I think very few councillors in Wellington would back. Uh, I mean, more people in Wellington, I, I was told today, are on buses than ever before. I mean, yeah. this is a time to, to double track um, the, the train network, uh, um, to improve uh, the routes going out to the hut, which is where there is, is real congestion in Wellington. Um, and, and this just shows that, that calls for cost-cutting and, and, and calls for, for localism um, are, are really uh, double standards from the government. Mm. What Follow-up question. Why can't we build anything in this country? Don't we need a new Ministry of Works 
Preach! Go to the mountaintop. <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, we should be having more conversations about this. And I think th- this is a problem all around the world, um, yep. major project failure. Um, it's also emerged as a problem as we've relied more and more on contractors and consultants to yeah. deliver infrastructure. Um, a lot of the big uh, uh, things that we're proud of today, including Parliament, including the, the wooden law school building in Wellington, including Brewmart, were built by uh, the Ministry of Works. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, a public entity um, that can have economies of scale, cheaper borrowing costs that can coordinate mm. um, has a lot going for it. Um, and I think uh, the, the last Labour-led government uh, started to develop uh, you know, a, a small version of a, a kind of prototype Ministry of Works. I think yes. it needed much more scale. Yes. Um, and I think if we were serious about something like um, inter-regional passenger rail, um, that would be a, a great use of, of $10 billion and would yeah. benefit far more people in the country and could be delivered by Ministry of Green Works. Damien, Auckland's second Harbour Bridge and Auckland Waterfront Stadium this long tunnel under Wellington. None of these things are ever going to be built, are they? Well, I just had a quick uh, check. Apparently the Auckland Harbour Bridge is one kilometre, which seems light to me. That I'm sure that, that Google might not be correct. But but a, a four kilometres from the terrace to Colburnie, which is what they're talking about, right? So, so what would it take from basically Freeman's Bay to uh, Devonport or whatever? That, that, that must be about the same length. So if we had to do a choice, wouldn't we're going to spend ten billion dollars going under there? Couldn't couldn't we do that? Because you see what happened with somebody ran a ship into the Baltimore Bridge, and Baltimore's kind of like got a few issues now. I mean, I think that might be a bit harder to do with our bridge, but nonetheless, you know, the clip-ons are getting a bit rusty. That bridge is the same age as me, so it's getting a bit long in the tooth. It can't go for that much longer. So no, I don't think Simeon Brown should be getting a proposal to do the uh, tunnel to Kilburnie. I think we need to go. Under the water matter. Let's go, boys. We can do this. If we have, we've got to have a ministry of works, uh, or a ministry of silly works. Um, I'm. Let's 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 just let's just pull it. Sign you follow up. up. Follow up. Question. I'll sign up. F- follow up. Question. Last week on the show, Michael Wood claimed the cost of breaking the Cook Strait ferry contract would be a staggering two hundred million dollars. Is National throwing? Ten billion dollars around as a number to eclipse the two hundred million. I mean, what's two hundred million between friends if we're talking spending ten billion? Um, well, it's, so far as I can see, it's just a proposal that they want to get done. But I look, um, I've I've done that airport to terrace run. It's about what half an hour, and they're saying it's going to cut fifteen minutes off half an hour, and. You, you know, I look. I think there's probably about the only time half of the politicians actually get to interact with, with you know, kind of hardworking New Zealanders who are driving the taxis and Uber. So, so no, I think no. If we're going to sp- if we're going to spend that sort of money, what a matter is the place to do it. Come on, boys. Hey, Reina, uh, Arena. Uh, thanks to the perception that Labor can't build anything, the public have lost faith in the government's ability to do everything. What does Labor need to do to win people's trust back? It's a good question about how we build a pipeline of infrastructure. And actually, if you look at the Labor government's record on building infrastructure project, that was happening and there was certainty, growing certainty in the industry. Yes. Cutting the Kiwi Rail expansion and the ferries meant that literally builders had to down tools yeah. on not only the Wellington side but the Picton side too. There were steel beams on the Picton side and that huge cost of getting out of the ferries, that's only the ferries. Mm. The building works mm. that had to stop for our contractors and our building construction industry was was massive and will cost the country hugely but it will also give um, those big companies that we rely upon to actually build things in New Zealand, no faith that they can progress with this national government's agenda to build things. This is also a bit cynical of them to propose a project that is outside the period um, where they are budgeting for. They've got a big hole in their budget, which they cannot deal with right now. And um, instead, they're proposing big projects, which they have no intention of making happen. Um, you know, they've already been slated. No. The, well, Let's Get Wellington Moving already considered this. They said the cost was eye-watering and they wouldn't be proceeding with it. So they've picked a white elephant that they don't expect to go forward with instead of actually funding the infrastructure that we need right now. Labour was out there actually building things, building school rebuilds, bu- building hospitals in our regional centres, and those are the kinds of projects that give the industry faith yeah. that the government will back them. Follow-up question. Did you, did you know... That what, speaking of white elephants, that that was one of the proposed names for this working group, this podcast. The, the white, white elephant. elephants. I yeah, like but, it. but what but, about but, heartthrobs? Oh. 
Bomber, Bomber rejected both names. He's very, Fo- he's very self-conscious about his follow, good looks. Follow-up <laughs> question: Will Labor go to the electorate when Winston causes a snap election with free public transport? <laughs> That is a really good question about how this priority of national government spending however many billions on a tunnel cuts to the heart of when they're cutting free public transport for kids, yeah. literally kids on buses going to school, and half price public transport for students for under 25s. This just speaks to their priorities. We need the government and the transport system to act like the adult in the room, look at how our transport needs across the system work together, things like regional rail, which Max has spoken about, but all of this working together to mean that we get modal shifts, that we're able to meet our climate targets, that we're able to give people genuine choices about how they get to work, and that Aucklanders are also able to get home and see their kids faster. Yes, we, we do need another way to get people around our city. I mean, preach. Uh, but but, the, but, the, but the, the other side of that, though, mm, is that the no, worse no, the no, congestion no. is, the more people have time to listen to this podcast. Those big roads get oh, more congested. Well, I, I don't know if the podcast <laughs> so. listening audience is really when we need to build our infrastructure. Could I make a, just a quick point about the future and the industries of the future? I think I think the problem with, with Damien's worldview is it sort of pretends that the, the state can be neutral. But this is a good example where, you know, investing in tunnels supports roads and cars. And if, you, if you step back and ask, hey, what, what is the vision of the future this government is presenting? At the moment, it's roads and tunnels yeah. and coal. Yeah. Yeah. And phosphate mining. Um, I mean, if the government can't be neutral, and I don't think it can be, like, is this the future that we want? It, it, it sounds as I don't know, saying like we're, we're kind of going back to the past. We're going back to, to, to old school Muldoonism um, at, at a time when actually industries in, in Europe are moving away from coal, and, and these are dying industries. Uh, no, no, no. Coal's a growth industry. The Chinese are investing massively in coal yeah, and nuclear. Yeah, comrades, we need a word from our sponsor. I was in town today, and cross my heart, this is true, um, with Andrew Kingston. And who did I run into but National Heart from Chris Pink? And it was an absolute delight for Chris Pink to meet. It's not the first time he's met Andrew Kingston. The other time he's met Andrew Kingston was in Walkworth, I'll have you know, at the French Café. Chris Pink walks in, and there I was with Andrew Kingston and our kids. And so it's... There's there's kind of the universe is is speaking that the universe, if you are running a business and you have got an accounts receivables ledger and people are not paying, the universe wants you to call Andrew Kingston. Call him on 0800 Gravity, go to gravitycredit.co.nz and Andrew Kingston, he he will be as excited to help you with your debts as Chris Pink was to see me and Andrew this morning. Uh, comrades, we must wrap the show with a final word. Damien Grad, your final word this week. I mean, it was so fascinating, that discussion about you meeting people in cafes. But what can you excite <laughs> us with now? What can you excite us with now? There are so many uh, interesting things, but I want to just talk about what the government is, is doing. And I, it's what I wrote about on the weekend, and, and I want to, to dwell on it. A couple of things are happening and two in particular which i think is really interesting the the changes to the resource management act currently the resource management act which had been in place since 1991 and when it kicked off it was about 300 pages and it's now over 600 about 330,000 words the resource management act as it currently is constructed means that you are only allowed to build essentially if you have permission or you're working to a, a government plan the rewrite, which has been done um, by Simon Court and Chris Bishop, as I've been reminded, is going to take a very different approach. We haven't seen the final draft yet, and it's probably one to two years away. But the idea is that it's going to be a much more permissive environment to building. And at the same time, you have Chris Pink doing a lot of work on changing some of the regulations. And the most interesting one is at the moment, if you want to use a building product in New Zealand, it's got to be one that is approved by various licensing agencies. And Pink is turning around and he's saying, well, hold on, if we have a product that has been licensed in a comparable jurisdiction like Australia or the United States, then you can use that product in New Zealand. And he reckons if we adopt the Australian system, that's automatically 200,000 products that come in. That in itself should bring down the cost of products in New Zealand. So it's it's going to take a couple of years and we're going to see interest rates still need to come down. But I think there is a, there is on the horizon, it may be two years away, I think there is some potential good news for for not those current homeowners. You might see your property values come down, but for those people wanting to buy houses, there is some potential good news. And I like good news. 
Uh, Raina, what uh, your final work this week, please? Yeah, picking up on the theme about what this government is doing. You know, I grew up in South Auckland in a house that was always full of visitors, right? My dad was a local councillor, my mum was a GP, and on Sunday night, I remember being a kid and having people sitting at the kitchen counter talking to them about their problems, you know, about their kids, about their health, about their local parks. None of those problems were easy to fix. And despite whatever progress we've made in the last couple of decades, the work's not done. That's why I got into politics. I want to help people with this stuff. And when I see the government setting targets for itself, which are essentially a tick box exercise, which are, you know, targets that they can easily meet, which are meeting things that they have already said on the election trail are a priority for them. It's so disappointing. This this stuff isn't things that we can fix overnight. Um, the real reason why we should be in politics to represent people is to have some ambition for our country, is to want to fix the problems which affect everyday working New Zealanders. Things like um, those Building Act changes, yeah, there's, there's a good direction of travel on that. People need warm, dry homes and they mm. need them built faster. Mm. But also pushing liability back down to the homeowner, which is the only regulated party by the Building Act, and unfairly blaming the resource management system that is meant to protect the environment that this government is run, running roughshod over isn't fair to anyone in the system. Actually, we need a way of spreading that risk more fairly so that homeowners aren't left holding the can and the government's not doing that part yeah. of the work. Yeah. We need targets which are actually ambitious, targets like reducing child poverty, reducing our emissions, which this government said they supported leg- at the legislation stages, but everything they have done is to, had to take away the policies which actually helped us get there, things like clean car discounts, things like you know, decarbonising our big industry in New Zealand are not things that they are going to progress with. I just think you know, we need leaders who want to get into politics to help people and nothing in this targeted approach, this tick box exercise, this running the country like it's a company is actually going to deliver any of that. Max, your final word this week, please, sir. Yeah, I think in politics we should be asking, like, whose interests um, is this person speaking for? Like, and whose interests is, is this government acting? You know, what, what, I don't say this in a petty way, but, you know, why is, why is Damien um, supporting big military action um, when he's, he's libertarian? Um, and why is, why is Damien um, not opposed to the fast track approvals bill, which is a, a huge centralization of power? I think it's because it's not really about the big state versus the small state. It's about in whose interests is, is the state acting? And I think the interests that this government um, are ser- is serving um, are becoming really clear. So, you know, we, uh, when we've seen more stories Stories of cuts to respite care um, uh, from uh, the, the cuts from Faikaha, you know, the talk of review of school lunches, the cuts to public transport. It's very hard to look at that government and say it's acting in the interests of the many in this country. Um, so I think, you know, what good journalism can do, what good hopefully political commentary can do is cut through that and say, um, actually, the interests being served here are the interests of a, of a much narrower group of people um, and serving uh, that group's interests is not uh, in the best interests of all New Zealanders. Mm. Before uh, Bomber takes it away with some dreary Marxist rant that, I mean, you may as well log off now, honestly. It just, it, this, the, the high point has been passed. But if you like what Max has had to say, you can find Max on Twitter at Max D.N. Harris. What does D.N. stand for? That's Please my, tell me it's D. Nuts. Names. Just my middle names. Just yeah. D.N., nothing exciting, no kind of post-Marxist. All right, so, <laughs> so Max D.N. Harris. Max is a, you also have, what, what describe the, the term, the door lawyer? Oh, door tenant. A yeah. door tenant. That is such a fantastic, I, I love this old English stuff. Um, but Max is a lawyer, in case uh, you didn't know, and I am reliably informed by people who do know he's quite a good lawyer. Uh, if you like what Arena Williams has had to say, you cannot find her on well, you can, but you haven't done I'll anything. Get back on Twitter. You, you haven't done you. anything since two thousand and three. However, you can find her at Arena A R E N A Williams. Uh, you can also find her on Instagram, which I understand you are active on Instagram at Arena Williams, uh, and on Facebook. Uh, uh, just search Arena Williams A R E N A. And if you want to follow us, apparently we have our own Twitter handle at Working Group. Work 2Gs, Working Group NZ. Go check us out. We will be so excited 
to see you there. Bomber, take it away. Thank you, comrades. My final word this week. We are such easily led muppets in this country. This pet bond is being paraded around as if it's some great win for tenants, when really it's just a new way for the landlord to charge two more fucking weeks rent on top of the five weeks rent they demand now. Let me get this straight. We are allowing landlords the right to kick tenants out at any time they like and we are taking food out of the mouths of hungry children to fund a $2.9 billion tax break for the richest landlords. Oh, 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 and you can pay them more two weeks bond for the pet you intended to hide. What's the point of pet bonds if you can't afford the bloody rent? Now he's done with the weather. That was The Working Group, New Zealand's number one weekly political podcast that is not funded by New Zealand On Air. Don't forget that The Working Group podcast will be available on Rover, Apple and Spotify right after this live show. You can also text WORKING to 3598 and you'll get all the links to our podcast and our social media. If you can also please leave a rating or a review and give us a follow, it would help spread the word. We'll see you Tuesday next week when ACT Party leader David Seymour and National National Party whip Chris Pink. Are heartthrob. Our National Party heartthrob Chris Kyoda, Pink. Kyoda and Carpai, you say classy, Artero. Hooray! Kyoda.